Hi class. I didn't change my clothes from the last video, but I did change my background. Uh, hope you guys are doing well today. We're going to cover module 10 um, and we're going to cover objectives two and three. So without further ado, I know I'm irritating the way I say that all the time. Okay, so let's just get into objective number two. Okay. What I want you to do with objective number two is be able to form arguments about why behavioral addictions are controversial. Because you may be thinking at this point, like, who cares? Why not just go with the flow? Everybody's talking about social media addiction. Let's just call it a problem officially in the DSM. Why is there only gambling addiction in the DSM? Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you is that the in the in the, in the DSM-5, there was one other behavioral addiction, but it was put in an appendix, and that addiction is internet gaming disorder. And it was put in an appendix like it was like, yeah, we think this is coming up. Gaming disorder might get into DSM-6, but... Right now, it doesn't have enough research. So they put that in an appendix of the DSM-5. So there's two that are currently mentioned in there. One, gambling, that's official. That's like seriously official. But internet gaming disorder, i.e. video gaming, right? Excessively to the point of harm, et cetera. Um, it, that one is in the appendix. Needs a little more research, but looks like that's going to be the next one. All right, well, why the controversy over behavioral addiction in the first place? I'm gonna go through several things. One is the disorder excuse. Another is a lack of research support. And a big fat one I'm gonna argue is free market drivers of consumption. I'll unpack it all, don't worry, when we get there. And then um, finally, I'm gonna talk about how upstream factors are generally ignored as I did in the last module, module nine, when we talked about some of these sociocultural factors. So we're gonna bring back some of that um, with regard to uh, the behavioral addiction. Okay. Oh, my graphic didn't turn out very well there, but these are all these people, you recognize these stars, I'm sure, um, that have been, who, who have used, who have basically said, I did these things, maybe, sexually harass something, somebody, cheat on their wife or something like that. They did some stuff because they're sex acts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, uh, you just call it an addiction and all of a sudden you got a nice little excuse there for doing something like that. So, and that happens because, you know, we get that with, even we use that with intoxication, right? Oh, he just said that because he was drunk and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I mean, it happens that we use that as an excuse. And so that there is reason number one, why we should be hesitant about putting it in the DSM. All of a sudden, everybody will have excuses for everything they do if we just keep adding everything to the DSM. Okay. Um, another issue is the lack of evidence. So a lot of behaviors are, are, are called addictions, right? And when there are addictions, and oh my Lord, look on YouTube, just look up food addiction. There's all, all these clinics and all this stuff that's out there that, that you know, uh, are saying, or videos that say, oh, this is what you should do. You know, I'm sure you've seen some of this, this is what you need to do to cut down if you're addicted to social media and all this stuff. And that is uh, really a little on the shady side, right? And it's never going to get too big. So don't worry about that treatment industry because insurance won't cover it. Insurance won't cover it because it's not an officially recognized disorder, right? But insurance will cover officially recognized disorders. And that's where there becomes a lot of money in the treatment industry. So, you know, just the fact that these treatments arise so quickly, we really don't know that much about these, all of these behavioral addictions, right? So I'm going to talk about which ones have more evidence and which ones have less evidence. 
So if we take those three factors that I talked about before, those three sort of defining characteristics of the behavioral addiction, that preoccupation, that kind of obsession with the, you know, the keep thinking about it, thinking about it and thinking about it. Or like, um, for example, let's say you were prevented from using your phone. Oh, right. All you could think about is what's on my phone, what's on my phone compulsion to do it this is the action of picking up your phone checking it checking it checking it. people are checking their phones like 150 times a day literally that's what the research is saying they're checking their phones that much and then harm you know you're not you're doing tiktok more than you're doing other things okay so all that that kind of thing if we if we take that at the the presence of those features of behavioral addiction and and we look at whether it's been supported in research for these various behavioral addictions what we see is that gambling has some real strong support there and part of that is because it's been studied for a very long time uh internet gaming disorder as i mentioned has some support it's pretty good support in fact um and and i've even published some some research on internet gaming disorder and there's a, there's a fair amount out there but again it's not yet considered to have enough research to get it into the DSM, although it's in that appendix, as I was saying. Internet use disorder, uh, you know, and that might be social media uh, kinds of things, overeating or food addiction, tanning addiction, sex addiction, shopping addiction, and stuff. All of these and all, any more you could probably name will have very limited support and that doesn't mean there's not research on them but the research is ongoing and you don't really have the body of research to be able to establish that these things contain this preoccupation compulsion and harm and what would be the cutoff on these to be able to create a disorder so and so i'm part of the problem is that there's just not very good assessments uh, to figure out who's got this and who doesn't and everybody's defining it differently and things like that okay so there's a ma major lack of evidence Another thing I'm going to argue is that we live in a free market capitalist society. And in a free market capitalist society, there's money to be made if you can get people hooked on stuff, right? And so that is going to be a major driver. Hedonism is the um, chasing things that feel good, right? And hedonism is also going to be rise to the top in a capitalist society because again it makes money if you can make people feel good then you make money off of that if they because they get hooked on these things that make them feel good so uh our economy depends on consumption that's the reality of our economy those of you who have taken business or economics know that we've got to get people to consume buy 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 that helps the economy and it makes people and it makes corporations money so uh, this concept of immediate gratification i need something right now that makes me happy right that sells. It's how you get people, you know, you don't want people to think about it too much. Well, do I really need to, do I really need that hamburger right now? Well, I could have a salad, right? That immediate gratification of, dang, this looks good and it smells good. Um, you can be happier, you can be better, you can be smarter, you can be prettier, you can be more satisfied if you just get right on this and buy it now, right? So, so the culture that arises from uh, a society like this is going to play a role in behavioral addiction. So when I talk about the free market drivers of consumption and hedonism, I'm talking about our culture in the US that drives behavioral addictions in some ways. And really what I'm talking about here is upstream factors, right? Not things that, that have gone with the individual, but things that go on with society. So let's look at some of uh, the, an, an example of this with regard to uh, gambling is in uh, electronic gambling machines. Electronic gambling machines have gotten really, really, really good at getting people to keep pressing the buttons, you know, and keep putting money in. And they do it with all of these kind of amazing, you know, things that they do. They've got all of these sort of techniques that get you going. Well, it starts with the habit formation. 
You develop a habit through these stimulus response associations, through reinforcement learning, right? You might get, for example, uh, you know, uh, your uh, this concept of the near miss or or reinforcements of the the machine dinging and things like that and lights coming up and things like that saying good job almost made it right um uh then that turns into eventually problem gambling and that's gambling behavior associated with some neg negative consequences but not clinically significant harm and then finally we get to gambling disorder so what's happening in the person there are all of these psychological factors um, you know, that are going to result from this classical and operant conditioning that are driving this. So if we can make better machines that get us hooked more, is the problem in the person or is it in the machine? You see what I'm saying here? Perhaps that machine is part of the issue. Okay. So let's talk about gambling. Uh, we've seen a steady increase in American spending on gambling over the past 30 years. In 2022, we saw a record high. We don't have numbers for 2023 yet. What are the contributing factors? Well, one, it, gambling is just super gotten widespread, right? It used to be pretty restricted. Now, uh, I think 33 states at the time that I'm recording this now have, uh, have approved of sports betting. Um, Internet gambling is common now, and of course didn't used to be. Sophisticated machines, like I was saying. Um, the normalization of gambling, it, it, which is this availability of it. You know, now you can uh, gamble really at your convenience. Uh, you know, if you run down to the convenience store and buy a lottery ticket, that's gambling, right? Uh, mega millions. There's advertising, right? We see a lot of advertising for casinos and stuff like that, state lotteries. Um, and the ideally, the idea was some of the profits were going to go to the treatment of gambling disorder, but it turns out that while we get you little 1-800 hotlines, they're not really uh, uh, effective enough to treat a lot of gambling disorder. And many, many people, as you know, from substance use uh, disorder in general, are not going to be seeking treatment or getting treated. So we got a problem there. We got a world that has this kind of, you know, loosened regulations on gambling. And then surprise, surprise, we have gambling disorder. Where's the problem? Is the problem in the world or is the problem in the person, right? So that's one of the issues with calling this a problem in the person is that we get some issues in society as well. I'm sure you just heard my notification go off. It's compul making me compulsive to check my phone, but I won't do it. The free market and internet use. Okay, so let's talk about internet use disorder. You know, we talk about social media addiction. I just recently published a paper looking at internet news addiction, people getting constant news feeds and notifications and being kind of addicted to checking the news. Internet porn addiction. Uh, you've heard of all these things. In the internet, this kind of modern day Skinner box is it designed to get us buying, to get us on there, to get, because ultimately all this stuff is so, so that we see these ad, you know, uh, so that we see advertisements and so that the platform can generate ad revenues, right? That's what social media is all about. We've got algorithms now, sophisticated algorithms that when I when I scroll down on Instagram, let's say, I, I, and, I, and I pause a little bit and look at something, it knows exactly how long I've looked at that. And it, it sees what I like and it feeds me what I like. It's giving me this constant, constant influx of rewards, rewards, rewards. And that's not even to mention the likes and the thumbs up and the followers and all of that kind of stuff. So we're on a variable ratio schedule. We've talked about that before, um, where we're not sure how much scrolling we'll have to do before we get to something good, but we know something good is coming. So we keep going and going and going. Um, this reward schedule um, combined with something called hope labor, 
which is the expectation that rewards are coming, ensures this constant con uh, content generation. We're always producing com content. In fact, I'm producing content right now. I'm living this lecture, right? Because I'm going to put this up on YouTube. So what is hope labor? Hope labor is this idea that one can get rich someday. I don't I really have this delusion that I'm going to get rich. Okay, but you may think that if you produce the right content, you're going to get rich and you're going to become a social media influencer and all this stuff. We have all of these stories about getting rich off social media in influencers making tons of money for every post and being sponsored by this or that company and all of that, right? And that keeps a lot of young people online and they're producing content. They're not being paid for it. They're producing content that is generating revenues for the platforms, but they're doing it for free. And again, this is this expect, we talked about cognitive expectations in another chapter, right? This expectation that one will be rewarded, right? And people have that for things like social media. So, you know, this stuff is designed to hook us is what I'm saying. It's designed to get us hooked. The free market and overeating. Our bodies have this biological system to maintain our weight. It doesn't work with our current lifestyles. Again, we've got this, we've got this, this uh, system that says whenever you encounter high calorie food, eat the crap out of it. If you get your hands on some fat, some salt, and some sugar, eat it. Right. That's a, the way our, our, our we were built and we were built that way in order to survive in a world of scarcity. But we're not in a world of scarcity anymore. Now we're in a world of plentiful fat, sugar and salt, and we just can't stop eating it. So this is the concept that we have right now, an environment that's this obesogenic environment. It's an uh, uh, environment that causes obesity. And it's these social conditions that, that just are going to make you very likely to overeat. Here's some contributing factors. Jobs now that don't require a lot of physical activity or labor. The used, jobs used, used to be more than sitting at a desk. Um, vehicles, transportation options. Uh, you know, we used to, when I was in college, I rode a bicycle. Nobody does that anymore. Barely anyone. I mean, now they ride the stupid little scooters that drive everyone nuts. Uh, increased supply. Uh, I'm talking about the bird scooters. Increased supply of food and calorie dense options. You know, we just have like, you know what all these foods are in this picture because they're everywhere and they're constantly being put in our faces. Sedentary recreational activities. Who goes out, you know, to the park anymore or whatever. We just sit there on the screens. Even if we do go to the park, we're gonna sit on our screens. Okay, so here's what I wanna emphasize. Upstream factors are very commonly ignored. We don't look at these societal factors. Instead, we look at the individual, especially when we call things a disorder, because we still are really focused on the disease concept, right? So we don't look at some of these public health issues, some of these environmental effects that may make us more likely to do this kind of thing. And then to boot, common neuro neurobiological substrates between Substance use disorder and behavioral addiction are deceptively convincing. You go, oh, wow. So social media causes the same dopamine rush that taking cocaine does? And you're just like convinced, right? But the problem with this concept of the hijacked brain, you know, my brain's been hijacked by gambling or social media or whatever, is that it supports this disease model. And the disease model is not the be all end all. We stop paying attention to environmental influences, to societies that, that seem to be built around, you know, causing us to do certain behaviors more. And so, so let's not stick with only that disease model. We've got to look at some of the sociocultural influences. We need to look at public health uh, approaches to treatment and prevention that we can change our environments, not just change ourselves or our brains. That approach is way too simplistic. Now, I don't want you to think 
then I'm telling you that the, uh, that the disease model is totally wrong. I'm not. There are real things that are going on in the brain, but <clears throat> it's just far too simplistic to think of addiction as being solely a brain disease. So with the upshot, are we medicalizing problems that are caused by larger systemic or societal issues? We have to consider both the biomedical approach and public health approaches. We need to look at treatment and prevention from a public health standpoint. How can we restructure society so that we don't get all of these problems? These are complementary approaches. You can do them both at the same time. You can treat people for the problems and you can tr treat society to make these problems preventable. But they're often pitted against each other and that's not good. I don't want you to think I'm doing that. So don't think that. Medicalizing is gonna put the focus on the individual and the problems are also gonna be in society that fails to regulate these kinds of harmful environments. Objective number three, and I'll be quick about this because I know you're tired of me already. Compare and contrast intended and unintended consequences of labeling behaviors as addiction. Well, let's look at why people want to do it because I'm sure you're thinking like, why would anyone want to do that? She's just been arguing all against it. Okay, well, why? The intended consequence is that you get consistent diagnosis, you get consistent classification. Right now, nobody knows. You know, everybody's diagnosing this stuff. You know, what is a social media addiction over here is different than what is a social media addiction over here is different than what is social media addiction over here. And now nobody really knows what it is. But if we can get it in the DSM, then we have a very consistent way of diagnosing. That also tends to increase research that may lead to prevention and treatment to decrease suffering in people. So these are the, the uh, benign things that people think will happen, right? The good things, the advantages of, of, uh, of treating behavioral addictions as disorders. But there are also unintended consequences. And these are social, and on the next page, I'll talk about some legal and other consequences that are unintended, that may cause problems. Okay. The culture of mental health will be infused into aspects of our daily normal life, and it already is. Check out this graphic. Here was an original DSM, to, well, that's not even an original DSM, that's DSM two. Then look at three, three R, four, 4R, and it just keeps getting fatter. And 5 is even fatter, which is not pictured there. And 6 is going to be fatter. And I can guarantee you that there will be more disorders in 6 than there were in 5, because we keep adding disorders and we take away very few. At some point, is, you know, are so many people going to have a disorder that mental health becomes this massive part of our daily lives? And that's arguably already the case. The question is, is it helpful or harmful to label a behavior as an addiction? Is it helping the person or is it harming them? Now, remember, stigma is a factor there. So suddenly uh, having it as an addiction could be, uh, you know, causing a stigma. The second is that it extends authority of mental health professionals. Who's making this DSM anyway? It's a bunch of mental health professionals. What do they do for a living? They make money off of, largely off of research on this stuff and off of treating people. Guess what? If you're making money, that's called a conflict of interest, right? Doesn't it make sense that I would want, if I'm, if I'm a practitioner, I would want this to be a disorder because if it is a disorder, then I can diagnose somebody, then the insurance company will pay me to treat that person because it'll be covered under their insurance. So it makes a heck of a lot of sense that the practitioners would be interested in, in creating uh, more disorders, right? And so, because this is simply a profit motive, right? If it's a behavioral addiction, it's going to need more funding. Where does most of the funding for research come from? It comes from, from uh, 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 public entities like the federal government. Well, 
what's going to happen when we are now diverting research money to behavioral addictions like social media addiction, uh, you know, internet gaming disorder and sex addiction and everything else like that. Is there, is there enough money to go around? Are we going to have less money for substance use disorders like opiate use disorders? Oh my God, my phone. <laughs> okay. So that's a huge problem is now we're going to get money diverted away from substance use disorders. Cause I can't imagine they're just going to provide a whole new pot of money. Right. All right, so there's also legal and healthcare consequence I want to touch on before we get to our little summary of this module. There's challenging legal issues. So with regard to criminal law, you know, we operate under this uh, concept of personal responsibility, right? Um, and, and that this is the idea that, you know, if you commit a crime, uh, you uh, it's as if you chose to commit it unless you can plead guilty with reason of it's plead not guilty with reason of insanity. And the idea there is that you were not able to control your circumstances. Well, with disorders, we have a lot of legal, you know, kind of blurry ground, whereas is the person actually responsible or not responsible or how, how much do they bear responsibility because they have a disorder? Um, so that becomes an issue in criminal law. Disability law, there are some issues as well in terms of accommodations because if a person has a disorder, then they are going to require accommodations. And so would we ever get to a point where, for example, a person has a social media addiction and so requires accommodations in class because they have a disorder? Well, currently in disability law, we do not, they do not make accommodations for substance use disorder. But, you know, I mean, the laws can easily uh, there be changed. So that's one issue as well. Another issue is disease mongering. Um, for example, pharmaceutical companies, now what are they going to do? Make a bunch of drugs that are going to be marketed towards social media, dis social media addiction? I'm like, really? It, well, they'd be developing it because they're going to make money off of it, right? Um, look how popular every, every single time some drug comes into the market that, that may help somebody lose weight, right? That's huge. I mean, and so food addiction, you know, I can see, you know, the drug drug industry going nuts and the treatment industry in general, right? Where all of a sudden all these new treatments are marketed. And why? Because they make money. Like duh, right? Okay, anyway, main takeaway, take home points. Let's get to the end here. Uh, module 10. Behavioral addictions are controversial. The most scientific backing for gambling. And next. Can you guess? Yes, internet gaming disorder. And then the rest don't have a lot of scientific backing. Drawing the line between normal and the disordered boundary, it's challenging. It really is challenging. Um, and I think we've got to make some decisions, uh, you know, and who's going to make those decisions is the question. Is it going to be, uh, you know, a small group of experts? Well, that's really what the DSM, uh, you know, does. Societal influences and environmental factors are going to have a big impact, and, and, and we need to recognize those environmental factors because, again, we're looking at downstream, but we don't look at upstream. You know, what are these environments that are promoting this stuff? We look instead and say, oh, we got a disease. That's what's wrong with us. The behavioral addictions field needs to consider the impact on legal issues and policy and funding, and that's probably why. We don't have this stuff in the DSM yet, but we'll see in the future. I actually think if my prediction is correct, that we will see more behavioral addictions going into the DSM in the next version of the DSM. Test me on that. All right. You guys have an awesome day and I'll see you next time.